and welcome to the third episode of Next Question Now. As you know, this is a live magazine style discussion where we bring passionate and thoughtful, engaging speakers together to talk about the tough issues and bring you some bold ideas about some very timely and sometimes tough, but always interesting issues. My name is Leah Roundtree, and I'm extremely grateful to have the opportunity to be hosting this discussion today, not only between our guests, but also with our community and our, and our live audience that is uh, part of this recording. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize the amazing team at Peterson Capital who are co-presenting and co-producing this series with me. They're driven to help investors understand macro trends and market context, which is fueling Canada's economic future. I've really enjoyed working with them to produce this series because we uh, share a passion for ideas and diverse opinions and bringing people together. And I would also like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who is listening in, all of our community members. We have just an unbelievable and overwhelming response from all of our platforms. It does fill me with optimism, not only for this issue, but also the many more to come that we have a forum to listen, learn, and then lead. And while this format does focus, does focus on the speakers and their ideas, I do encourage all of you who are listening in to further the discussion on our platforms because you can find Next Question Now groups on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and, soon, and YouTube, and soon to be a podcast channel where we plan to post all of the recorded sessions. And as of now, you can use your Q&A button to forward questions, which I'll be moderating with our speakers. So let me say next, thank you so much to both of our speakers who have each volunteered their time to have this discussion with us today. And their biographies and experiences are broad and robust, but I've chosen just a few things to highlight before we get started. So Faisal Saeed al Mutar is an Iraqi American human rights activist, writer after numerous death threats and attempted kid kidnappings from Al Qaeda. Uh, for his secular writings and lifestyle, and sadly losing a brother and cousin to sectarian violence, he came as a refugee to America in 2013. He's the founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, which is an organization that translates Wikipedia pages, academic articles, and other works that cover science, literature, philosophy, into and other uh, into Arabic in an attempt to empower individuals with knowledge that's often suppressed by regimes and data in dictatorships. He, uh, co he founded the Global Secular Humanist Movement, now called Global Conversations, and he formerly worked for movements.org that assists dissidents in closed society to connect directly with people around the world. And Heiko Women. Now I have to say thank you very much to Heiko who is tuning into this live from Beirut, it is 2.30 in the morning. So we really appreciate it, extra specially his participation here today. He oversees the International Crisis Group's Iraq, Syria and Lebanon project. He's got a deep understanding of domestic politics of Lebanon, Syria and um, the Syrian civil war and post-war Iraq. Prior to joining Crisis Group, he was an associate researcher at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. He has also published with the Carnegie Middle East Center and MERIP, and recently oversaw and edited academic volumes on elite change and new social mobilization in the Arab world. He does speak four languages, but we're delighted that he's going to speak English for, for us here today. <laughs> so our topic, um, our topic is a big one. How can we prevent future humanitarian crises? And I'd like to start with Faisal, if you can open up with some remarks as to how you see this issue. Sure. Well, well first, thank you, Leah, for, for having me and, and be connected to you again. The, I mean, as in every issue, there are three ways of, of looking at it. I mean, th there is the things that are within our control, and there are the things that we can influence, and then the external factors we have no control of. So that will be national disasters, things that, that are really within the control of both the international community and, and domestically. And within both that, there is the thing that we can do from abroad, international development, uh, mainly whether, whether it's regional or international that's coming from the Western countries or coming from countries in the region. And there are things that needs to happen within these countries. And I can probably touch first on, on that and what I'm, what I'm working on, which I think is really an, an essential um, element here because there has been generally the conversation 
has been, and well, that's one of the reasons why I have started an organization and I'm trying to do change on the ground, is the question, Joel, is like, how can the West help the Middle East? And I think the Middle East, the question, in my opinion, should be how the Middle East help the Middle East with possibly outside Western support. Um, and, and I think that's when, when we looked at these many of these conflicts um, as, and, and there are obviously not all conflicts are equal. Some, some have more domestic factors than international and some have uh, international, I'm sure Heiko um, like can talk more on details on the Syrian conflict, the Syrian Lebanese conflict, which both have both international regional factors. So I think that the, the change um, has, the, the, the thing that we're trying to influence within my organization is that how can we in, inspire and empower, number one, before inspire, actually empower those voices of moderation who are rejecting the reasons of destruction in the Middle East. And, and that's where sectarianism, corruption, which I will put at, at the top, and the same time, the regional influences, which are really pushing for sectarianism and corruption. So I think that the the, the question generally, whenever there is uh, any terrorist attack or any, any action like that, the question is, where are the moderates? And the thing is that the moderates do exist. And they, at, at the moment, but at the same time, that it's easier to start a terrorist group in the Middle East than to start a, a moderate one. And so an important part of that is the lack of funding and lack of training. So if we provide more training and more funding and more knowledge actually to empower the, the, the ideas that many of these people have and give them with the right tools, then they can create change from within. And I think that's where really the, the solution is, it is domestic, but with international support. I think the combination is no, uh, it's definitely that one uh, a significant part, I believe, uh, of the solutions in the, in the Middle East. Well, I know that much of your work is focused on that, particularly through Ideas Beyond Borders, where you have quite an army of translators who are translating documents and, and, and works so that, uh, so that Arabic speaking people have access at least to information. So let, let's turn it over to Heiko. Heiko, how do you see, how do you see the best way to prevent human crises in the future right <clears throat> right thanks Leah so um, I, I mean I, I would I would want to uh, to, uh, to speak about two things or two aspects so so one one aspect is um, um, to basically um, do things to uh, deter other people not people but usually governments and regimes but sometimes non-state actors too to deter these these actors from doing terrible things that that create humanitarian crisis, right? And we're talking now as we speak. The, for instance, you know, the, the Taliban are um, are taking over Afghanistan, right? I mean, uh, that 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 is really what's happening uh, there. So, I mean, what can anybody outside of Afghanistan uh, in this particular situation do to uh, to to prevent? revenge massacres really against moderates exactly in, in Afghanistan uh, who, who may who may be exposed now in this situation and 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 this is a really a really really a tough question you know because if, if you remember um, in 2000 actually before even before 2013 maybe uh, there was uh, in Syria you know there was a, somebody uh, tried to to establish a red line against the use of chemical weapons. You know, President Obama said that the use of, red, of, red, of, uh, of chemical weapons would be a red line for him in Syria. They were used with the, uh, and um, nothing really happened to the Syrian regime. And uh, ever since it was clear that, that practically the regime there could act with impunity. You know? I mean, there was a previous uh, also very, uh, very uh, bad example for the, of this happening in Bosnia. In, 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 the, in the town of Srebrenica, right, in 1995, when, uh, when a UN safe zone was overrun and 7,000 maybe men and men and, uh, and young males and men were killed in the aftermath. Uh, and, and this like promise of protection, like supposedly enforced by NATO, uh, that was not upheld, you know. And these, these situations create like this, this terrible, you create this, like, you, you, you you give a message essentially that uh, whatever 
stride from abroad to prevent to, to prevent such uh, humanitarian crisis is not is not worth very much. Mm -hmm. So this so this so this is one scenario. This is where you're trying to de de to deter actors from creating these crises or making things worse. And there's the other situation. There's the other uh, the other setup where you have situations that produce a humanitarian crisis with actors producing a humanitarian crisis, not necessarily because they were terrible, you know, but they're like incompetent, they may be predatory. And as an after effect of that uh, humanitarian crisis emerges, like we have in Lebanon today, like for the, like this coming winter, I think we're looking as a prospect of, of a famine here. You know? And so, so then, then what, what do you do? I mean, in a situation like that, you know, where you, it's not a natural disaster, uh, it's, it's man-made, but also you can't really deter people from being incompetent, right? And so, and you can, maybe you can deter them from being predatory, but then who do you deter exactly if and that's the main problem here in, in Lebanon, but you have it many other places. And how do you deter predators if the whole state, like, across the board is a predatory setup you know and so so i mean and then and then so how what do you do about that you can go and and you can go and distribute uh, food of course mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. famine okay famine you 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 send food but how long can you do that you know how long can you can you distribute few uh, um, food to, to to keep people from starving you know and i mean it's of course it's it's demeaning it's disempowering and it's not sustainable, you know. So then, how, what do you do in a situation like that to to change this trend around when you don't have a local counterpart, when you don't have institutions that um, that uh, that you can cooperate with to change that situation, you know? And when the people who are competent in in this particular country or in other countries, you know, uh, are either have no chance to get to the to the levels of power or are indeed leaving not necessarily because they're persecuted, but simply because they can't survive. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've opened up a really interesting point and uh, especially around the, you know, what can you do to, 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 to uh, I guess, fortify against incompetency? I, I mean, my, my first inclination would be to, to ask, is it democracy and institution building? And I would, I would say, you know, even in Western countries where we have democracy and institutions, it's not a it's not a pure fortification against incompetency always. But um, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, ask you to, I'll ask you to answer that just in a moment. But Faisal, you know, do you agree with with Heiko's points? Yeah, that's definitely. I mean, the the I, mean, I think really the bigger bigger question is what to do about that, which I think I mean it was raised. And I do think that um, there is a lot of room, uh, especially, if, I mean, I, I live in the United States and, and, and especially room when it comes to aid and choosing of aid um, and really using kind of the sticks and carrot. I mean, many of these countries in a way are dependent and including the corrupt leaders are dependent in many, in many times on US foreign aid, including many countries in, in Egypt and, and, and not the ones that are having great chaos like, like, like uh, Syria and Iraq, but they do receive a significant amount of American support. And there are ways in which some of these uh, things can, can change and, and, and some of the policies that exist within these, these in a way dictator or, or kind of corrupt incompetent uh, dictatorships in which we're gonna give you this if you do this. We don't do this, we're gonna might do something worse that will damage your, your government. So that I think is, I mean, the, the, the question is that and that's, I think, where the Obama red line and, and kind of the change of policies with a Republican and a, and a Democrat administration here in the U.S. is there are different approaches. There is the diplomatic approach and there is more, not necessarily the, the war approach. So, for example, um, not to extend that example, but the killing of Qasem Soleimani, okay, is was a very targeted, well, in my opinion, very defensible attack of, of Iran. And it what is sent the message is, America is, we, we, we watch you. So if you're going to play more, we have a stronger military power that actually can kill your biggest general. I think that and, that, and that was really, in my opinion, deterred to some extent Iranian influence. So when, and that is actually a bigger, big factor of the corruption that exists in Iraq, of the corruption that exists in, in Lebanon, is the Iranian influence. So I think is that it, Iran, America did not go in a war with Iran, but it showed them who is the one in charge 
and who is the one that they're actually not the most powerful influence in the region. So there is ways that I think is that what in, in, in which the pressure and sometimes physical pressure um, that that requires some sometimes some boldness, some risk taking, um, and some of that risk obviously goes in a very bad direction in some in, in, in some situations. So that's where the role of analysts and the role of of really trying to assess the information. And most of the information, like during that killing of Soleimani, were all, no, if we attack Iran, they're going to fight back, they're going to destroy the United States bases. None of that happened, because most of the intelligence showed that Iran is actually incompetent to fight the United States. And it happened, and Iran eventually, in a way, sucked it up. And they, they, they accepted the fact that, OK, the US embassy in Iraq is the largest in the country. They have a lot of intelligence, a lot of people within Iraq that can actually deter Iranian so they try to, in a way, play, play the game. They, they then try to, well, for example, now this administration, to some extent, the change is, oh, the Iran deal have to restore, which means we're going to accept everything Iran does because the Iran deal is more important to us than Iranian mm -hmm. interference. And we're focusing only on the nuclear uh, part, not the fact that Iran is destabilizing most of the countries in the region. So I think that the way we approach these, these things can really change um, the, the situation on the ground. Who is killing the biggest murderers in Iran? In Lebanon, a couple of months ago, they killed one of my one of the known writers for for human rights and peace. Hezbollah killed him. That's again Iranian controlled supported militia. The the biggest killer of murderers in the Middle East are Iran, and 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 there are big reason why Bashar Assad stayed in power. There are big reason why why we have a lot of destabilization in Iraq, and there are big reason why Hezbollah is in power. So. We know the enemy, we have to do something about it. So Faisal, if I'm just trying to distill your comments, so so you initially said that um, the West uh, is maybe too involved because it's better to sort of build the capacity within these regions themselves. Um, however, there are some cases where it's important for the West to get involved. You just made an example where the West uh, was responsible, the United States was responsible for killing one of the major generals. Um, so it seems like a sort of fine line. And and I guess the, the issue around um, the current administration and sort of supporting Iran, that's an economic interest. So if we ask the West to selectively be engaged, but they seem to choose, pick and choose based on economic interests, is that an effective way of determining when the West should get involved? Uh, I mean, when the West should be, get involved is definitely a difficult question. Um, the reason why, the, the, knowing that, the, for example, I mean, not all enemies are equal. The, the case for Iran, and, and the, as I said, the change has to come from within, but many of these moderates cannot fight Iran. They cannot deter Iranian interference. So you need to have a bigger power that can actually stop that. So that's why I think the, the US intervention, change has to come from within. And that's what I think Western intervention, aka US intervention. As for economic interests, I mean, U.S. has other economic interests in other countries in the region. So they do, do have economic interests in Saudi Arabia and many other countries. So the U.S., I think, I mean, maybe the policy was to maintain economic interests in the Middle East uh, without necessarily siding with Iran. There are other countries which have a lot of, in a way, significant wealth that 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 United States currently is benefiting from, um, and and not necessarily have to side with the one that actually is, is playing a major role destabilizing the region. So I think you not, I think that there are different countries in the region. I think the US economic interest, you can have both. You can have the economic interest and supporting the moderates. And statements from the UAE, for example, the United Arab Emirates, not I am in any way endorsing any of the Gulf states. I'm not in any way con connected to them, but I can see a shift in policy, to some extent within the Abrahamic Accord or not even the Abrahamic Accord is that the, the spokesperson of the UAE government talking about the need for supporting moderates and they're willing to create initiatives. So that's change coming from Arab countries. That's coming from the UAE, which has economic interests within the United States and is a great ally. So Heiko, would you like to wade in here in terms of the, uh, the role of the West and also back to uh, our previous question, which was, um, is democracy and institution building enough to uh, mitigate uh, incompetence? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. So, um, so a few things. I mean, is, um, what what uh, to what Faisal said about um, about um, like let's say targeted use of um, 
military might, uh, violence, and, and if you want military violence. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go off policy now, as I threatened to. <laughs> At least it would be controversial, maybe in my institution. But I'm not saying it's like um, I I think I think it's it's this is a tool among tools, right? And and we have to think very carefully uh, whether we want to use it or anybody. Not we as in not we as in in crisis group, of course. But basically, any foreign policy actor needs to think very carefully about uh, how to use it and when to use it and also how to threaten its use you know so mm -hmm. if if i if i say this is a safe zone you know and then i don't enforce that safe zone mm -hmm. and then like in a situation like in srebrenica for instance the only way to enforce it would have been military action i mean it's, it's really that simple you know and and uh, in 2013 the only way to enforce that red line uh, would, would have been to do something serious about the, the red line being breached, you know. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you if you make these pronouncements, and I don't think I, I'm not saying you should make them, you know, but you should. I mean, as a policy for policymakers, it, I think it's extremely important to to think about what kind of commitments you make, uh, and and then to think really to really think uh, how would you would deliver on these commitments uh, if you basically challenged on them right and sure, there's credibility there I credib well right. well i mean yeah you i mean the credibility if you don't deliver uh, the, credi the, the credibility is lost right you know mm -hmm. and i mean and and i mean i would go a step further and say you know so this whole like credibility the credibility of this whole like um, like support, um, support, de supporting democracy uh, approach, you know, I mean, is is to me is a bit questionable, you know. I mean, I was in, I was working as you said, as you mentioned in your 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 intro, uh, I was with that German institution in two thousand thirteen, uh, you know, when uh, events happened in Egypt. Remember when uh, when the current ruler there came to power, you know, and I really, I mean, I mean my my colleague, I'm, I mean, I'm not I'm not working on Egypt, and I have no opinion on Egypt because I live in in Egypt, right? So I don't have an opinion, or I can't afford to have one, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but but you know, so I was seeing my colleague, you know, and he was being imp like the people in the German Foreign Office, people from the German Foreign Office, were imploring him. Do do not call it a coup. Uh, so I mean, uh, so why and why were they why they were imploring him to do that? You know, because because the concern, the overall concern, trumping everything, was stability. You know, so this like stability paradigm that that uh, that Western policymakers have in the region is a, is a very I mean is a very let's say it's a very two-sided one you know and it's a, it's a problem for credibility you know right right now what is what, what is happening in tunisia right now you know the one the one example supposedly for su successful democratization and in the in the region you know initiated from within you know i mean and which is now perhaps being turned into again into yet another uh, state with a with a, like a strong leader you know, which which, which questionable demo, uh, democratic uh, just democratic uh, credentials, and and where's and where's where is where are the supporters of democracy and um, institutional building on, building on now? Um, well, I've got a question yeah. that's come in from the audience just on that specifically that perhaps both of you could answer, and that is: Is there really any other solution to those immediate crises, especially when it's an issue of? power and use of force by local authorities is using force the only way in that moment to stop them it's sort of you know in, as a last resort you can think of prevention as being you know you know um you know long-term prevention but in those moments is that the only is that the only answer i don't know i don't know if faisal wants to say something first since i talked um, last that definitely not the only answer um but it's one answer and i think is that many of these things can go hand in hand i think that the supporting democracy battle has been lost especially on the western credibility part because in many cases the west has to work with a lot of authoritarian regimes in the middle east so it i think that that credibility and i think there's something to be learned from the chinese involvement in the middle east which is which i'm in a way like many organizations are monitoring that is focused a lot on economic uh, power 
So an economic might and building bridges and building kind of China being viewed as an economic power that is not trying to destabilize, but rather okay with the authoritarianism part, but at the same time, create the projects that create some economic development. However, that's definitely questionable because we're not yet understand the involvement of the, uh, and the, really the, the, the change that we'll make. But it's something to be learned is that we, there's a lot of ways to intervene economically in terms of supporting initiatives, supporting projects that actually might not give us political freedom, but it might give economic freedom, which are in many cases, the major driver for people leaving their country. The people, Morocco can, or Tunisia can be stable or democratic, but at the same time, Tunisia still want to escape to France to get a job. But if you have a France that they can make Tunisia a place in which you can have a, have a job, raise a family, even if Tunisia might, might be, not have the biggest freedom of speech, but have a good economy, that would be like Singapore. I think how many Singaporean refugees you see, you see in Canada? I think there's very little. Uh, and I think if we make Tunisia more like Singapore, I, I think we're, we're gonna have more Tunisian tourists, not Tunisian refugees. Michael? Well, I mean, so so I was I wanted I wanted to to talk about that what what Faisal said about uh, like economic incentives and, and and penalties if you want and, and of course there's this big the big the whole big story or debate on sanctions you know so what mm -hmm. what what can sanctions do and what sanctions cannot do so I think if we <clears throat> if we're trying to 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 look at this. Uh, at this, like you know, with a with a cold eye of realism, uh, I think my impression is that that authoritarian regimes and going back to the people who who do terrible things, you know, the the creators of humanitarian crisis. You know, um, I I'm I don't see um, Bashar al-Assad being very impressed uh, by sanctions. For instance, right, um, and I think I think it's a very simple calculation. You know? It's a very simple calculation that is, you know, uh, whatever the cost is uh, of uh, of sanctions. Uh, so first of all, an, an authoritarian regime is in a very good good uh, position to distribute the cost away from itself and onto the population, of course. You know, so that's one thing. But the other thing is, I mean, if you know, if the alternative is between economic penalties and uh, and losing power, I mean, that it's it's. I think you call that a no-brainer in English, right? You know, there's no choice. And of course, they of course they hold on to power. You know, whatever whatever the cost, the economic power is, because um, losing power means you're dead. You know, and in right. a very in a very bad very best situation, uh, you're in exile in Saudi Arabia or in Moscow. You know, depending where your uh, what your allies do. So I mean. You know, giving. I think. I think you can give some incentives in this or that direction. You know, but but I mean, and, and we, I'm seeing this now in Lebanon. You know, they're talking a lot about like sanctioning Lebanese politicians and all of this. I can see people, politicians, leaders, so to so-called leaders, making tactical compromises to evade to avoid sanction. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, giving not giving up on anything, but making like some tactical moves. To uh, to get away from it, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't see anybody really changing behavior that is uh, that is that is basically the behavior that is at the root of the of the that is the root of the problem, you know, right. because this behavior it's, it's it's this behavior is not irrational. This behavior is a rational pursuit mm -hmm. pursuit of power. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I don't think you know, I, I I'm not don't want to say anything positive about Bashar Assad, obviously, you know. Um, so, but but I, I don't think Bashar Assad is a sadist who 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 enjoys burning down cities, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's 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 the it's it's the cold pursuit of power, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 any means that is necessary at any cost, you know, to maintain so that way, power. Yeah. If that goal is to have ultimate power, then what he's doing is incredibly rational in alignment with that goal, even if it's not. Yeah, it is. Uh, if, even if it's not something we appreciate, just to move things from the economic sphere and into more of the state building sphere. I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to merge. So what has gone wrong? Well, it might be easier to ask what has gone, let's do that. Let's say what has gone right with state building efforts, if anything, and how can we learn from that? And a, a subset of that question is, is there a role or what are your thoughts on charter cities as a tool for overcoming 
corruption and you know if, if you're not going to build a state in the traditional method is that is the charter cities idea a concept that might have some success um i actually would like to go give an example where i think what what went right uh which is a successful example of the no-fly zone which the united states has put on saddam hussein in the northern part of iraq of kurdistan uh, after the first gulf war in 1991 the united states has said they're going to protect the northern part of, Kurd of, of Iraq, which is the Kurdistan region, now it's called the KRG, from Saddam's attacks. And they have, to some extent, provided some economic support uh, to the Kurds and allowed some, and because of the fact that this part of the country was stable and was not under the sanctions, and I'm, I'm actually, I'm not the biggest fan of sanctions. In fact, I think sanctions harm the population more than not, but they were not under the sanctions and they give them economic empowerment. If you look at other parts of Iraq, Kurdistan region is actually the success story of the Iraq war. Not as, um, the Iraq war and the no-fly zone. It's not the one that is talked about quite frequently, but you can see a, a bit, a massive difference. While there are definitely elements of corruption, uh, there are definitely elements of really authoritarianism. I mean, in many cases, Kurdistan is controlled by one family, if not two, who really control most of the most of the country since like since <coughs> actually the no-fly zone. However, in most of the Middle East, you, all, you don't look at what's good and what's bad. You look at what's bad and what's worse. What's well, so better, what's worse. So really, actually, what's bad and what's worse is actually more realistic to go to make it more realistic. And if you go to Kurdistan and you do go two hours east of that is Mosul, and that was controlled by ISIS. You see a huge difference. You go to the you go to the south, which is controlled by Iranian militias, and you compare that to Erbil. There's a, good, a great difference. So I think is that the but that, that actually an example of what went right, of some correct policies that could have been, I mean, could, could Kurdistan be a more successful example? Could they be the next Dubai? Could they be an economic hub in which more countries and more businesses come in and encourage uh, employees? Of course, there are now three I mean, American universities. There are some training and connection between them and Western universities to have high skilled uh, students. Uh, job opportunities are low. Maybe there should be more work on that. But they are a better example of, of intervention. As for the charter cities, I have no expertise on the subject. So, so I, mm -hmm. I think Heiko would definitely have more, more to say on that. So Heiko, well, the question again, so uh, any, any experience or what, what has gone right in state building and any comments on charter cities? Uh, well, if you explain to me what charter cities are, I mean, because I, I have to admit I'm I'm ignorant concerning the concept. You know, I mean, you you mean like some something like uh, municipal control over uh, over funds and administration, decentralization? Is that is that what it means? Yeah, roughly? I guess. It and we can skip over that if that's neither of your expertise necessarily. But in a sense, um, if you think about um, the freedom for local regions or cities, I guess, to administer and, and govern themselves oh, yeah. in okay. a way that yeah. creates competition between them. So, for example, on a macro level, um, you know, countries do that in that they say, OK, our country yeah, okay. has these sets of policies come here and you ex essentially experiment with what people actually want. That's a that's mm -hmm. a big broad description. Okay, so I mean, since I mean, since you just 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 said that, you know, like let me respond to that part one in, uh, immediately, uh, you know, because I mean, it's it's actually a discussion that you that uh, that in, in you have in some places, not under that term, but but I mean, the idea is basically you haven't you sometimes have this idea that I mean since you know that the central state is uh, is incredibly corrupt and maybe incurably corrupt mm -hmm. you know, and it's ingrained and systemic corruption in many cases um you know and it is extremely difficult to disentangle you know because it's a it's like it's like a like a clockwork you know and they're like each cog moves another cog you know and you can't just fix one aspect of it you know i mean if the other if the rest is still working the old the old way and then okay so, so go down to the local level and do it there you know and avoid the problems of the central state by going local and uh, mm -hmm. and I had this like this, ni uh, this nice conversation in Bosnia actually with a, with a guy who was pr promoting this idea and say basically he told me you know like uh, um, uh, the, the municipality they were go about municipalities you know say mm -hmm. the municipality municipality is the is the, the the outer perimeter of of trust 
is where mm -hmm. people know each other, where people, uh, where like whether you can establish local accountability because things are on the local level. People understand how things work, and they can hold people who do do it the wrong way accountable. And you know, and and I'm I'm always having this question mark on this and say I think okay, it's it's the outer perimeter of of uh, of trust, perhaps. It can also be the the outer parameter of parochial control, right? Mm -hmm. And of uh, and so so you can you may solve the problem on the central level, but you may also create little local dictators, right? And local mm -hmm. power structures that mm -hmm. that you know that that I mean that sometimes can be can be very uh, can be very uh, or even more oppressive, you know. Maybe not as violent, you know, but oppressive too. And uh, when you think and and not democratic and not uh, not towards building towards like a successful economy, rather to be, like establish local control over economy, not in a very competitive way, you know. I mean, there's this there's a famous quote by, um, by Ernest Gellner, who said like in the in the feudal, uh, in the feudal society, in the grand feudal society, you're either ru ruled by cousins or by kings, right? Mm. So you're either mm. ruled by your family, you know, or you're ruled by a central state, you know. And and mm -hmm. Ernest Gellner, I think, was firmly on the side of kings rather than cousins, you know. <laughs> First, right. I mean, at, yeah, because at least at least on a on a on a like on a local on a on a if you're talking about a national level. You know, then there is interests. Of, uh, it's about interests and not about family anymore. Right? So, so yeah. I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit skeptical about about this idea. You know, and yeah. and also and also in the in in the, in the middle in the Middle Eastern context. I mean, it's it's very often it's this decentralization or, uh, or local rule is is a code word for um, for ethnic separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, like if you the, the, the smaller the area goes, the smaller the unit becomes that you're talking about, uh, the more likely it becomes that it's homogeneous, homogeneous, right? Right. right? And that you and that you get rid of all the unwanted elements, you know. And uh, and this is something. I mean, I think it's a very dangerous trend, you know, uh, because in the end, however small you make you make the unit, there will always be some unwanted elements, you know. Mm -hmm. And then what happens to them? So I mean, this is. Something where I'm a bit, sometimes a bit skeptical about about these these uh, these proposals. Um, so um, so so about about the, the the institution building right and and democracy. So so I think I think one one I mean and, and about the example of Kurdistan, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan is a is maybe a good one you know and on, on, in that sense you know so you have this it's ruled by one family. As uh, as uh, as Faisal said, the Barzani family, and and even the opposition, by the way, is one family. <laughs> you know, the second political force that that it sometimes, some ways, in competition is one family. Only it's a very divided family right now. So it's cousins again, cousins fighting each other. <laughs> and uh, but but I mean, I mean, of course, he's right. You know, I mean, it's still like um, for a long time, and probably even still, it 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 has been a much more livable place than, than many other parts of Iraq, you know. And and so so one perhaps uncomfortable conclusion is that I mean if you set out with these like concepts of of, of good good governance and, and, and accountability and whatnot, rule of law, you know, all these buzzwords, you know, all these UN buzzwords, I'm, I'm sorry to use that language, you know, but mm -hmm. I mean like these words and terms and concepts that uh, are like almost you that you almost obliged to use in uh, in 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 in, uh, in all whatever project proposal you do you know and then you export them or you want to imply them in these areas in these countries you know i mean you're going to have trouble right right, right. you have to you have to do some some adaptation and you have to start making compromises and those compromises are likely to be quite uneasy compromises, you know. And then, like, uh, and 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 it and it puts it puts you in a very awkward position uh, to do this, you know. Like, like I had a I had a conversation, like um, just a small example. I had a conversation like a couple of months ago with uh, with a UN agency here in, uh, in 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 Lebanon, and I was asking them, uh, like, with all this aid for refugees, you know that. The, there's a lot of cash assistance for refugees, you know, for instance, you know. And I said, so, so can you tell me 
what exchange rate you're using. Because in Lebanon, we have multiple exchange rates. We have like, I think by now 10 exchange rates, you know, it's crazy. And, uh, and the central bank imposes an, one exchange rate or two, and then there are many other exchange rates. What kind of, I mean, are you, are you pay, you're getting dollar budgets, you know, are you paying the, the cash assistance out in US dollars or in local currency? And I told me local currency, we have to, like by rules and regulations and also for practical purposes. I mean, we can't just fly pallets of cash dollars into the country, you know? So we have, we're paying out uh, in, in low cost. I told him, so I asked him, so uh, at what exchange rate do you pay it out? And I said, uh, we won't comment on the exchange rate. Mm. Uh, and then a few months later, it became apparent like that over a period since the crisis began about $250 million were essentially like redirected into the Lebanese banking system as the uh -huh. effect of, of these manipulated exchange rates, you know? Right. And so, right. right, so which is, I mean, unbelievable, you know, and, uh, and now they're, they're trying to do something about it and actually paying that out in dollars, but it's these uneasy compromises that you're doing all the time, you know? So you have right. to work, somehow work with the local, with the local situation. And, and you have a really complex legal setup where, I mean, this is, this is legally speaking as a UN organization, this is what you're supposed to do, this is what you have to do, but you can't close your eyes to the fact that actually money is going to the wrong people, you know, because the people, the local institutions that you need to work with and you can't really work around them always, you know, mm -hmm. they are set up as systems of predation. That's the bottom well, line. You know? Sadly, it might be, might be shocking, but it's also somewhat predictable, I, I suppose, yes. in a way. I just, but while we're we're just about out of time, but I want to get so thank you, Heiko, for that. That 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 is, I love the um the specific example because I think that that helps take a, a broad concept such as corruption or predation, as you say, and 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 make it sort of real in terms of the real time example. I've got two quick questions, so we'll do sort of a bit of a rapid fire response here. Um, Number one is, what about Turkey and Iran destabilizing the region deliberately to support their own goals? I mean, you're not only working with internal politics, but you're also working within an ecosystem that's been created by the region. And there's some disincentives for stability. Can you both comment on that? And I know that's, again, a big question, but just in a, with a moment each. No, definitely. I mean, and that is what I think is the biggest argument for U.S. intervention in some sort, or, or a NATO intervention, is that if America doesn't intervene, someone else will. And that mm -hmm. someone else will probably, will be much worse than America. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, and that is generally, I think, is the argument <coughs> for, because if you're making comparison, I mean, you have the Russian uh, intervention in Syria, you have the, uh, and you compare by all of these different interventions and, and, the, and the countries mentioned, which intervention is the one that actually can create more prosperity will create damage definitely uh, but by comparison and that's the thing is the scale that and, and that's a compromise in many cases you have to deal with so, so i think is that that's where the and by intervention i not necessarily just mean military i think that the intervention as, as a broad concept when knowing that there are other players who are in the region who are trying to pursue interest in many cases against the interests of 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 the of the nato allies and 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 the United States. So I think that is something to always keep in mind. If America doesn't intervene, who will intervene? Right, right. Thank you. Heiko, what's your perspective on that, about the dynamics of the destabilizing? So, yeah, so, 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 I mean, I think, I think we, we are seeing, what we're seeing is that, um, that the, um, the strategic balance or the, in, for the region is, is being, in the process of being renegotiated, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, negotiated doesn't mean pe people sitting at tables, but it means, um, but it implies a lot of a lot of violence and a lot of uh, like brinkmanship and all of this. Um, so, saying that the U.S. should intervene um, is uh, is is one way to look at it. You know? uh, I think what what if if that were to happen. I mean, I mean, we better we better be sure that there is a sound strategy behind mm -hmm. it. You know, that is the, the sound strategic objective behind it. I mean, I mean, what what we've seen over the past um, five years, um, I think, um, to me, did not look 
like a sound strategy, uh, to be very right. honest. You know? So I don't, I don't want to don't want to make this into a discussion about Iran and Iran policy and and Vienna talks and, and all of this, you know. Because I mean, um, it's it created extreme tension in in many places around the region, you know. And um, I did not have the impression that this was a like a co cohesive strategy that was well planned, rather than uh, rather than guided by 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 haphazard moves and and knee jerk uh, reactions. You know, in the bottom, in, like I mean, here I, I mean I would like to come back to one thing that Paisal said in the very beginning, this idea to help uh, to help Mina help itself. You know, I mean I think this is uh, this is a very good idea. You know, I mean I like I really like that that part of it, and of course like all things that are good and uh, make a lot of sense it's it's very difficult it's a very difficult thing to, to achieve or else it would have been achieved already if it's so obvious so obviously makes sense you know so why don't we achieve it why don't we do it because it's actually not very extremely difficult and not easy to mm -hmm. achieve you know so and i think like i mean whatever um like wh whatever we think the us should do or not do with the iranians um or other problematic areas in the region you know like i mean their neighbors will have to live with the Iranians for the past, for the, like for, for forever, right? You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, unless we believe uh, that, uh, we, we believe there's a real chance uh, for regime change in Iran as a real chance or a real chance, which to me sounds remote, or a real chance of having this regime, this regime change its behavior fundamentally, you know, for the better, right. which might, which I think is even more remote. So, um, and you know, so, so, so I'm not sure what where the strategy should point, and I think it's I would be much rather in favor of like supporting dialogue processes that are that are regional, like between the Gulf states and the Iranians, for instance. And, and these these talks are going on, you know, these conversations are happening, and and supporting those processes, I think, um, is perhaps a sounder strategy than uh, than confrontation. Thank you so much. We actually are at time right now. So this last rapid fire question will literally just be a one word answer as hard as that may be. Um, so Pfizer, <coughs> if we to look into the crystal ball, do you expect that the Biden administration will end up using force during their term? Um, uh, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, Heiko, do you expect the same? Uh, uh, no, I don't. Um, some, I think, some, I think a lot of people in the Biden administration are hardwired against the use of force. Well, that is going to be the topic, I think, of one of our upcoming next question now uh, discussions. I can't think. Uh, I, I can't thank uh, both of you enough. Again, Heiko, you've come in at two thirty in the morning. I, I have to say that you're incredibly coherent and uh, and thoughtful. Thank Much you. More I would be at that time of day. And Faisal, just thank you so much for your contribution and also for all of the work that you're doing. I know that you're not only thoughtful about the uh, about the big picture issues, but you really take um, what you're passionate about to a grassroots level, both in working with organizations and individuals to really get information into people's hands. So we'll make sure that that, uh, that our audience is familiar with, with all of the organizations that the two of you represent. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much again to our presenting uh, partner, Peterson Capital. Thank you to everybody who's listened in and we very much look forward to furthering the conversation on all of our social media platforms. So thank you both. Mm -hmm.